Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be a Bible study on hurricanes and harp. Are they doing weather modification? God's judgment? What? Now, the first thing I want to take a look at is HARP, H-A-A-R-P. A lot of this information is from Wicked, what I call Wikipedia, because it's Antichrist. But HARP stands for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. And that's A-U-R-O-R-A-L, auroral. You've heard of the Aurora Borealis. Has reference to light. Well, guess what Satan's called? He's called an angel of light. So, all right, let's read a little bit about what Wikipedia has to say. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, HARP, was initiated as an ionospheric research program jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, the Navy, and uh, recently, well, um, University of Alaska Fairbanks. And it was part of the Defense Advanced Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. That's known as DARPA. Perhaps you've heard of the uh, the dog that they've the mechanical dog that they've uh, invented, DARPA. Now they'll tell you that this is a um, my comment. This is they're going to tell you that this is a. Uh, weather research program but wouldn't the why is all these military people involved you know the navy the air force darpa uh and according to wikipedia it was designed and built by bae advanced technologies bae is a the largest uk hold on all right, so BAE is supposed to be uh, the most, the largest defense contractor in Britain and Europe, and it's supposed to be one of the three top three largest defense contractors in the world. So you know, here it is. You got the Air Force, the Navy, DARPA, and it was designed and built by BAE. Now, here it is. People will tell you that this, uh, if you believe HARP is for anything other than studying the weather, you're a conspiracy theorist. But, you know, here it is. You've got all these defense contractors, the military, DARPA, you know, <laughs> under a shroud of secrecy and cl uh, classified information. You know, that's, let's face it, if it was going to be weather studying the weather and stuff i mean why wouldn't you just have universities do this uh with no secrecy nope you got military involved so anytime you see military involved and uh classified information you should be very skeptical now in the 60s there was uh the military went before congress and asked for mo money to study weather modification and um, so is that what this is for? I don't know, because I'm not working there. I'm not part of the deal. All right, so HARP was helped develop by DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. According to Wikipedia, Wikipedia is an agency of the United States Department of Defense responsible for the development of emerging technologies for use by the military huh okay so what does that tell you now are these crazy weather we've been getting these earthquakes hurricanes what have you uh, are they being is are they we are we weaponizing weather i don't know but this, uh, when I was working, I was a manager of a hotel in Denver when they were building this. And our hotel was real close to the airport. 
and I met a guy who was a pilot. He wasn't for a major airline. He, he was what, uh, what do they call that? He flew for um, charters, and he flew to Alaska on a regular basis. Now, when you get become a pilot and you start flying, you buy what is called a FAA map, an aeronautical map. The FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration. And on this map is a list of areas that you are not allowed to fly over, period. You want to get shot down? Uh, <laughs> fly over some of these areas. Now, this was years before 9-11. This was about seven, eight years before 9-11. And, uh, for example, you're not allowed to fly over military bases. You're not allowed to fly over the White House. And, you know, I had a newspaper. It was called The Spotlight. They were put out of business by a bunch of wealthy people that didn't like being exposed. Um, they, were, they would cover the meetings of the Bilderbergs and Trilateral Commission and, you know, those kind of people if you've heard of all that, uh, Rockefellers, you know, those kind of people. But uh, they mentioned HARP when it was being built and first under construction. And this pilot told me, he, he, we were, I was talking about HARP and all, what have you, and, you know, I like talking to people. And uh, the guy comes into the front office with his uh, flight bag in his pilot's uniform and I was talking to him about harp and stuff, and he's like, "Oh yeah," he says, "I've uh, I fly to Alaska uh, occasionally," and uh, he actually opened up his case, showed me the map, the FAA no fly zone map, and there it was, that little area where harp was, and he said, "You know, that's a thing." He says, "I can always tell when they're running this thing because the instruments on my airline, uh, my aircraft, go nuts." He says. When that thing's running, he says, the instruments just go nuts. He says, you, you can't even trust them. So he says, I hate flying anywhere near that thing in Alaska. And, you know, you're not allowed to fly over it, but just being near it, you know. Was this guy lying to me? I, I don't know. But, um, I mean, you're talking about a 20-something-year-old conversation, but that kind of stuck with me. So, I don't know. All I know is we've had some weird weather. And the rich people that own the media will tell you, oh, well, you know, it's climate change, it's global warming. But in the 70s, it was, um, they said that we were coming into an ice age. I mean, it was like every week there was something in the news, the TV, the radio, the newspapers, global cooling coming, an ice age. But now it was, you know, now it's global warming, which now they're climate change. So that kind of like covers everything, right? So, but the, the thing was, is back in the 90s, the mid 90s, the government denied that HARP even existed. But there it was on the at aviation map, no fly zone. You're not allowed to fly there, but the, pla but the place doesn't exist. So, you know, when the government lies to you, you, you better get suspicious, you know? All right, so what does this have to do with hurricanes? Well, you know, the thing is, if you're shooting radiation, uh, if you're generating power and you're shooting radiation. What is radiation? Well, people think of radiation, they think of uh, nuclear radiation, but x-rays are radiation, microwaves are radiation, uh, visible light is radiation, infrared, ultraviolet, uh, radio waves, TV waves. That's all radi different types of what they call radiation. But what would happen if you were shooting like microwave radiation into the sky and, and heating things up. I mean, that's what hurricanes thrive on, heat. And then because of the spin of the Earth, um, you get these cyclones or whirlwinds, you know? So is there a thing? Can they guide these? Can they create these hurricanes? Can they guide them? I don't know. I'm not part of the deal. 
But let's read what the Word of God has to say about all this. Now, are evil people uh, wanting to control the weather to dry out the areas of the people they don't like? Are they using weather modification to further their Agenda 21 where they want to depopulate certain areas? I don't know. However, well, let's take a look at what the good book, the scriptures say. There's a book called the Book of Nahum. All right, Book of Nahum. It's in one of the minor prophets. It's one of those small little books just before you get to the New Testament. It's spelled N-A-H-U-M. It's in chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1. The Burden of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria was the empire before the Babylonians. They took northern Israel into captivity a number of years before Babylon took Jerusalem and Judah into captivity. So, all right, verse 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. All right, so in verse 2, it says, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. What is wrath? Extreme revenge and hatred, right? Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind. Now, what's a whirlwind? Tornadoes, hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So who's in charge ultimately? God is. So even though wicked men might have be using harp, they're being allowed. Let's take a look at some things. All right, let's go to the book of Job. And, uh, oh, by the way, people, I am on, um, although I'm not abandoning YouTube, I am on real, www.realreal.video, V-I-D-E-O, um, that's where my main channel is going to be. I'm kind of abandoning Minds, M-I-N-D-S, because they will not allow any video over 15 minutes. And I'm still on BitChute, but I'm, I think Real is going to be, end up being my main channel. Um, I got on Fakebook. Somebody asked me to go on Fakebook and um, help be a moderator for their channel. And I did, and it took about 12 hours for me to get banned by Fakebook. 12 hours. That must be a new record. I don't know. So, that's the way that goes. All right. So, Job chapter 1. Who's in control? All right. Verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed means he hates and avoids it. He, so he hated and avoided evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses in a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. I tell you what, you got to have a lot of land and you got to have a lot of servants to take care of that many animals. I mean, let's face it. Um, verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. So, sounds like this is their birthday. And sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting was gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all, 
For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, a lot of people will say, Oh, well, Job was offering sacrifices for his sons, but he neglected his daughters because he didn't care about his daughters. Well, you know what? Maybe the daughters were a lot more godly than the sons. Uh, the Bible doesn't say, but, you know, that's the choice. Either Job didn't care about his daughters, or maybe they were a lot more righteous than the sons. I don't know. So, take your pick. But yeah, people tell you that uh, Job didn't care about his daughters using this as proof, but I disagree. All right, so verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God... Now, if you want to, you can correspond sons of God with Genesis 6. This is the reason why God did the flood of Noah. And you could also look in Job 38. The stars, the sons of God, shouted for joy when the earth was created in Job 38. Now, the thing is, people will tell you that sons of God are men, sons of Seth, you know. Adam and Eve had Seth after it Cain, uh, Cain killed Abel. Well, how could sons of God be humans, be men, mankind? How could they be mankind in Job 38 when they shouted for joy when the earth was created? You see, Adam didn't come until six days after the earth was created. You see, first the earth was created, and then six days later, Adam was formed from the dust of the earth. So either, it just doesn't make sense, okay? I mean, the Bible, you, record, you, you look at the first six days of the Bible, of the creation. Nowhere, verse uh, day one, two, three, four, five, or six, none of those days record the angels being created. So, you have to assume that they were, the angels were created prior to the earth. I mean, that's, that's how I look at it. Logically, that's the only way I, I can see it. I mean, obviously, angels exist, and yet they're not recorded in the creation of the earth. So, but, you know, that was the thing. Sons of God shouted for joy at the creation of the earth. So the sons of God in Job 38 had to exist before the earth, then the earth, and then six days later, Adam. And then people will tell you that Adam was shouting for joy before he was even created or formed from the dust of the earth. Doesn't make any sense, people. So, you know, when you read Genesis 6, when the sons of God had married into the daughters of men and they had giants, uh... They're walking on very, very, very thin theological ice. That's all I can tell you. But people will call me a heretic for that. Well, actually, they're hoping that you won't turn off your TV for uh, an hour or half an hour for one program a day and, and actually sit down and read the book. Oh, no, please don't read the book because you might learn something that's important like I have. So, all right, verse 4. I'm sorry. All right, well, verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. All right, so, and it was so when their days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. All right, so now verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Now, wouldn't it make sense that sons of God are angels? I mean, after all, who was the father of the angels? God was, right? Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, I love this. 
And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? You know, where are you coming from? As if he doesn't know, right? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, mm, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. You know, I'm just walking around, hanging out, you know. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth God Job, doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, does Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made an hedge about him? Now what's a hedge? It's like a fence, but it's plants. And let me tell you something, people. There are plants with thorns that they use to make hedges around houses and stuff. And those are even better than barbed wire because they're, they're thick and they're full of thorns. And you ain't going through there. Uh-uh. No way. So what's a hedge? It's a protection. It's like a fence to keep the bad things out and the good things in. Doth God, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and above and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Oh yeah, you've given him all kinds of stuff, but if you take everything away from him, he's going to curse you. That's what he's basically saying. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Ah, God says, Everything that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So in other words... Satan, you can touch anything he has, but you can't take his life. Verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them. Who are the Sabaeans? I believe they're Arabs. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So the oxen and the asses, gone. Verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. Now remember, God gave Satan permission and power to do this. It says the fire of God has fallen from heaven. This is not fire from God. This is fire from the devils, from Satan. Okay? The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So evidently, Satan has the power to bring down fire from heaven. It says, the fire of God has fallen from heaven. Where else do we read about this? All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Where does fire from heaven come down from? All right, uh, Revelation 13 and 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, and another Bible verse says the, uh, that old serpent called the, the devil and Satan, that old serpent, the dragon, right? So let's take a look at that real quick. All right, that's in Revelation 12 and verse 9. You see, the Bible interprets the Bible. At least the King James does. If you use modern versions, you're, you're going to have problems. 
you don't make the connections. Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon, the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Cast out of heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So who's this dragon? The devil and Satan. All right. Back to Revelation 13 and verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. See, God's going to give him power to continue for forty-two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, if you're supposed to go into captivity for your faith, you're supposed to go willingly. You're not supposed to fight. If they want to kill you just because they want to steal something from you, that's protect your family. But if they if they say, hey, Christian, uh, are you willing to die for your faith in Christ? You don't fight them. You go patiently. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. All right, verse 11. We're getting to the punchline here, people. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Ah, but this isn't the lamb of God. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he's going to sound like the lamb of God, like the Messiah, but he's really going to speak like the devil, the dragon. Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell in therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Listen carefully. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Let's read that again. And he doeth great wonders, miracles, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, 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 six. So this guy is going to be able to make fire come down from heaven and devour his enemies. All right, let's go back to Job chapter 1, uh, verse 16. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. So evidently, Satan has the power to bring down fire from heaven. Think about that. 
course, God has to allow it. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made, made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Who are the Chaldeans? Uh, they were part of the Babylonians. You'll read about them later in the book of uh, Jeremiah and the book of Daniel. While he was, verse 18, And while we, he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So not only can Satan bring the fire of God down from heaven, there came a great wind from the wilderness. What, a tornado probably? Maybe? I, you know, a great wind from the wilderness? And it's, it hit the four corners of the house and it fell. And they're dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. You see people, even if harp is being used, and I personally believe a lot of this modern technology is what I call fallen angel tech technology. Because let's face it, if, if let's just say the earth for the sake of argument is 6,000 years old. Now, if you go to college for two years, you can get an associate's degree. If you go for four years, you get a bachelor's, Six years of college is a master's, and then eight years is a doctorate or a PhD. You know, if you live 6,000 years, uh, that's the equivalent of 1,000 master's degrees. I mean, are there a thousand different subjects in the universities worldwide? I mean, can you imagine having 1,000 different master's degrees? I mean, how much knowledge would an angel be able to accumulate in 6,000 years? I mean, let's face it, people. 150 years ago, people were on horseback. Now we're taking rockets up into orbit to, you know, with satellites and what have you. You know, jet airplanes. I mean, I can fly halfway across the world in basically 12 hours, you know? I mean, you know, it, when you leave uh, the United States, it's light, and when you fly halfway across the world, it's dark, you know? I mean, that's unheard of. I mean, just it used to take months just to go from England to the United States on by boat. Months. Could take, you know, a couple months. So, all right, what does the Bible say about a whirlwind? These hurricanes. All right, let's take a look at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 19 and 20. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. Now, what's a whirlwind? A tornado, hurricane, cyclone, typhoon. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days... In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. What are the latter days? 
That's just another way of saying the last days. Are we in the last days? I don't know. Uh, people have been saying we are for the last couple thousand years. So, all right, let's read some more. Jeremiah 30 and verse 23. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Hosea chapter 8 verse 7 For they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind it hath no stalk the bud shall yield no meal if so be it yield the strangers shall swallow it up Now have you noticed that a lot of these Probably the majority of these earth uh, hurricanes are happening in what they call the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt's basically considered Texas to the, um, I guess the, you could say the Carolinas, you know, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Georgia, North and South Carolina. That's basically considered the Bible Belt. Now, I remember... When I was traveling through Texas, they were having a really bad drought. And the churches were, um, some churches, a couple of churches were getting together and asking everybody to come and pray for rain. Well, we're going to get back to that later and in, in very shortly. But why are these hurricanes hitting the Bible Belt? I mean, here it is. You've got all these churches, all these people going to church on Sunday, people that believe in Jesus. Well... Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. In other words, don't be a gossip. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Listen carefully. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. What? For the time has come that judgment, not wrath, judgment. Churches, lying pastors will, will, will tell you that we aren't, oh, we're not under God's wrath. And then when, when something bad happens, that's judgment. People lose their faith because they don't know the difference between judgment and wrath. For the time has come that judgment must begin, must begin at the house of God. Let's read that again. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And the answer to that is hell, of course. So, is it just hurricanes? What about drought? Let's take a look at that. All right, what about drought? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1. Now, please remember... Jesus changed the law. Oh, let's take a look at that real quick. All right, in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse, oh, I don't know, thir verse 35. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, and this is a, a lawyer of the law, the Bible law, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him, Jesus, asking, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So when you get people that call themselves Torah keepers uh, telling you you got to keep the laws and the Sabbath and all this kind of stuff, well, you know, and then they'll tell you Paul's a false apostle because he changed the law. No, Jesus changed the law. Love the Lord, love thy neighbor. And hopefully you don't live next door to a bunch of evil Satanists. And if you do, I suggest you move because it's not a good idea to love God's enemies. We're to love our enemies. I don't believe we are to love the Lord's enemies. I don't love Satan, sorry. And if Satan was my uh, neighbor, I think I'd move. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Wow! Isn't that what Jesus just said? Yeah. And keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments alway. For know ye this day, for I speak not with your children which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord. What is chastisement? That's getting whipped. That's a judgment. That's not wrath. When you spank your children because they did something stupid that could have endangered them or somebody else, that's not wrath. That's judgment. You know, uh, when you get your bottom sp uh, spanked as a kid, that's chastisement. That's judgment from the Lord. Okay? And which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles, and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath destroyed them unto this day. And what he did unto you in the wilderness when ye came into this place. And what he did unto Dathan and Ibrium, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Egypt. I mean, of all Israel. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land whither ye go to possess it. And that ye may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, their children, a land that floweth with milk and honey. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken, listen, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Isn't this basically what Christ said? Yeah. Verse 14. To love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain, the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. And what happens when people get fat and happy? Verse 16. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Gods of money, gods of sex, gods of Harry Potter, uh, whatever. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Football, baseball, uh, soap operas, general hospital. 
verse 17. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain. Drought, people. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit. And yes, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Guess what happens when there's no rain? The crops don't grow and you die of starvation, people. That's what happens. California's in drought. You know, California, the, the granola state, fruit flakes, nuts, um, where you could have an abortion, but if, God forbid, you touch an eagle's egg, you can go to jail for five years. I mean, you know, eagles are protected, but you can abort your child. Um, the Church of Satan was founded in, I think it was Los Angeles. Uh, San Fag Sicko is the gay capital of the West Coast. I mean, really, people. And you wonder why California's in drought? Okay. Verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign between your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, you're supposed to tell your children when you're sitting down, when you're walking, when you're lying down, when you wake up, not on church for 30 minutes on a Sunday only. No, it's not the pastor's job. It's the parent's job, the mother and the father, to teach the children. Thing is, the parents don't know anything about the Word of God, so how can they teach the children? And then you send your kids to public schools where they teach them evolution, and Harry Potter, and vampires, and everything else that's wicked and evil in this world. You're supposed to teach them, people. Not sit around watching the football game, or the baseball, or basketball, or soccer, or whatever. Verse 20. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. And For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you. What nations? The heathen satanic nations. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereupon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea, shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. What do you think, people? Are we under God's blessing or are we under God's curse? And a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land, whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gizram and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side, Jordan, by the way, when the sun goeth down in the land of the Canaanites? which dwell in the Champagne over against Gilgal, beside the plains of Mora, And it shall come, for ye shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein, and ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. All right, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. 
Let's go to verse uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, in other words, they did evil, but now they're turning back to the Lord, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house, then thou... Uh, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sins of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, drought, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin, turn from their sin. You see, those churches in Texas were praying for rain, but I didn't hear anything about turning from their sin. I heard nothing about that. Nothing. Oh yeah, let's pray for rain. Well, it says you got to pray, confess the name of the Lord, and turn from their sin. You see, there's a things that you have to do. Just because you pray for rain, that doesn't mean nothing. You got to pray, confess the name, and turn from their sin when thou aff uh, afflictest them. Then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk, and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if the enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, where whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all the people of Israel, which ever know, which shall know every man in the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. That's scary, people. God knows our hearts. For thou, even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men, that they may fear thee all the days that they live in, the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Wow. Do we need a second witness? Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, that's disease, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, you've got to humble yourselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So, the people that are called by his name, humble themselves, pray, seek the Lord's face, turn from their wicked ways, and then and only then will the Lord hear from heaven. Think about that, people. Am I afraid of harp? Or what they can do to us well you know what <laughs> greater is the Lord than he that is in the world so you know what people let the evil wicked ones do what they will but if you're close to the Lord you will even if the whole world is in famine if the Lord has to, he'll send manna from heaven to feed you, just like he fed his children in the wilderness. And there's coming a time when 
being a Christian is going to be illegal. Matter of fact, it already is in the United States. Most people don't know it. If you want to take a look, take a look in the Noah, into the Noahide Laws. N-O-A-H-I-D-E. Noahide Laws. They're on the books. Being a Christian is technically illegal. It's punishable by death and by beheading. Where have I read that uh, beheaded before? Where have I read that in the Bible? All right, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years years. People, in the United States, it's already illegal to be a Christian. And guess what? They're just not enforcing the law yet, but that will come to pass. But you got to realize something. Most pastors, in my opinion, work for the enemy. It's your responsibility to learn. It's your responsibility to teach your family and your children not the pastors. The pastors actually lie to you because they care more about money and members than they do about teaching the truth. You know, when, when the prophet Jeremiah came and, and confronted the people and the priests and the kings and the princes and told them that they had better change their wicked ways or God was bringing judgment uh, they wanted to kill him. They don't want to give up their sin. America's no different, people. The Bible Belt has these hurricanes hitting them because what? Judgment begins at the house of God. People don't want to give up their ways. You know, you know when you know more about uh, your favorite baseball team and, and football and and who's who's dating who on whatever general hospital or whatever i don't know what i don't know what soap operas are anymore i mean my mother used to watch that garbage but uh, uh you know what can i tell you and uh, get yourself a king james bible and read it ask the lord for understanding and spend time learning i mean that's what i did Oh, and you can get a, uh, there's a company, I think it's, I uh, forget, Hendrickson maybe? They sell the King James Bible on CD. You can get the New Testament for about $20, $25. And um, it's narrated by a guy called Alexander Scorby, S-C-O-U-R-B-Y. Excellent. You can get the um, regular version or you can get what is called the dramatized version. You can't go wrong. Pop it into the CD player on your way to work each day. You'd be surprised what you'd learn in a few months. Be very surprised. Instead of listening to whatever's on the radio, stupid talk radio, uh, music, you know, what can I tell you? All right, well, I hope this um, study, you learned something. But learning something and not applying it is worthless people it's worthless so all right well all blessings praise glory and honor to the lamb of god slain before the foundation of the world and that's jesus who is the christ in his precious name amen